I am extremely pumped today. You know, our subject is always what great agents need to do right now to make to do some business and to start moving their business forward as this whole world opens back up. And we have such a awesome guest uh, for everyone to hear today. Um, we have SVP, Senior Vice President of Research and Development of HSF Affiliates, Mr. Alan Dalton. Alan, welcome. Great to be here, Mark, and, and good day, good afternoon to each and every one of you that's joining this program. Uh, and I hope that everybody is, is safe. First of all, Mark, is there a delay or can you hear me okay? I can is this hear coordinated? You perfectly. You're coming through fine. Okay, great. Um, you know, Mark, it's, it's a real privilege to be associated with you in any way, and especially here today. In fact, I spoke with Gino Blafari, the chairman of HSF, and, uh, and I was saying, gee, I'm going to have the opportunity to be part of uh, Mark's program on Tuesday. And I says, what's your greatest sense of Mark? And he says, Mark is one of the few people in the history of the industry that combine consummate leadership, operational acumen, and is also a great human being. And so coming from Gino, who I know we respect as much as anybody ever in the industry, then I spoke to Chris Stewart, our illustrious CEO, and he said, if we had a few more Chris Stewarts within the network, we'd take over the world this year instead of 10 years from now, <laughs> because that's Chris's uh, goal. And then Troy, I mean, then uh, Troy is always raving about you, Ariason, Amanda. So everybody has tremendous respect for you, Mark. And, and that's very notable because the only respect I ever get is over the last few months, I've only heard three things about me. One person after one of my events came up in, at the convention after I did my demotivational uh, seminar and said, uh, oh, Alan, by the way, I, I agree with some of what you said today. That was number one. The other person came up and said, hey, Alan, you're looking good, but you're not good looking, okay? And, um, and so those are the types of compliments uh, that I get. And then I received an email. Somebody said, Alan, you're a real trip. So that's about the extent of the applause that I received. But you know something, Mark, because I am Senior Vice President of Research and Development, and because we're in, we are in the middle of historic times, unfortunately, I did a little research on you and what makes your company and your empire what it is, okay? And in fact, some people are into numerology, the study of numbers. I'm into words and letters. So the first thing I notice is that your name, okay, Mark Stock is one of the only names that has Ark in both names, okay, both your first and your last name. And I thought, Mark, are you trying to save the industry as Noah's Ark? Are you, are you trying to enhance it? What is the situation, okay? And I can mention Noah's Ark politically because Noah was revered by both Islam religion, Jewish faith, and Christians. And so, so that was one thing. I mean, is, is, this, is this going on here? The next thing, when, when I looked at your growth, I remember that Marco Polo, okay, <laughs> Marco Polo, so if we put an O to your end of your name, Marco Polo started as a Venetian merchant, and I remember we had dinner one time in the Venetian hotel, and I'm thinking, there's got to be something there that, that's behind Mark. And then I said, well, is Mark expanding either as a feudal empire or as city-states, but it was city-states because I did research on city-states, and city-states didn't control the territories. They empowered everybody. And I've got to commend you, Mark, because you're not into controlling people. You're into collaborating with people, empowering people, and giving them resources. So then it led me to think, what is, what is Mark's why? And here's the why. You are making arid... You are making arid real estate cool, K-O-O-L, because I noticed that all of your markets are either in arid or semi-arid regions, which shows how prescient you are because you're the only broker anticipating rising sea levels, and you, you're going to, and as Noah's Ark, you're protecting everybody, and you're in growth areas, and so that has... That's everything I need to know about you, Mark. But now, let me get to another letter in your name, R. 
I use the word ah because I think of three words that are very appropriate for today. We're going through a horrific pandemic, and now what we're going to experience is that the country is reopening, the country is going to look to recover, but this is also an unprecedented time for us to reimagine our businesses. Uh, we've never had this time to take a step back and rethink, re-strategize what we need to do moving forward. And nobody is more strategic than you, Mark, and I know you would appreciate uh, what I'm going to say now. In fact, thinking of rethinking and reimagining, it begins with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services with our CEO, Chris Stewart. Chris Stewart has come up with three dimensions of reimagining that I think are truly historic. The first concept that Chris has introduced is that we need to take the brand, the forever brand that's Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, and have consumers see us as forever agents. His next concept is we've got to close the real estate loyalty gap. Chris points out that according to NAS research, 9% of consumers indicate they have every intention of returning to their realtor, but only 12% do. We must close this gap because otherwise we're going to be very vulnerable to listing side disruption where people are gonna go in and they're gonna take over the control that we've had with home sellers. Buyers, buyer disruption wasn't harmful because buyers don't determine the fees and buyers don't generate listings. And buyer disruption helped brokers reduce their advertising and it helped real estate teams to develop because now listing rainmakers can control the destiny of the leads. Listing side disruption is the only place that third party portals can now go to further monetize their ROI. And so we've got to close that loyalty gap because we've got to disrupt people from going to the internet to find a listing agent, a marketing agent. And the third concept that Chris has introduced is real estate is to create a real estate ecosystem. Uh, because oftentimes somebody buys a home, five years later, they look to put in a new kitchen and they don't even bring in their realtor because they don't recognize the realtor as having value in that realm. So these are, the, these are three big strategic thoughts, but I wanna go now from the strategic to the immediate tactical. What do we have to do today to make more money and be more successful? Number one, we have to reimagine how, what we, how we communicate when people approach us about real estate. 100% um, of everybody on this uh, program today his income is determined on how they communicate. Now, for years, when, home, when consumers approached a realtor, they would say, how's the market? That's going to change because now when people ask historically, how's the market, oftentimes they did it for a conversation starter to break the ice. They had some interest, but they didn't have anxiety. They weren't nervous. They weren't troubled. They weren't looking for deeper answers. And our industry certainly didn't give them deeper answers because the way a lot of people responded to the question, how's the market, was lame. It was, it was answers like this. It's unbelievable. It's great. I've never been busier. All I need is a few more listings. So, so these, this made our industry look like the confederation of dunces, okay? But it didn't matter to the consumer. It's not as though the consumer said, oh, my God, what a... What a trusted advisor, what a deep analytical mind at work here. Those responses were conversation killers and room clearers. Now when people approach all of your agents, Mark, they're gonna have a deeper interest. They're not gonna say, how's the market? They're gonna say, where do you think things are headed? What do you think's gonna happen? So there's a tremendous anxiety and confusion throughout the country. So I want to, first of all, how do we respond to that? Anytime anybody comes up to any of your agents and says, where do you think the market's going? Or what do you, what do you think is going to happen? Here's my suggestion. You answer like this. First of all, thanks for asking. Now, 99% of realtors never say thanks for asking because they haven't been through corporate sales training or professional training for months and months because you're taught that anytime anybody ever inquires about anything you're selling, you thank them for asking 
because then you're going to come back and ask them. So it's the principle of reciprocity. So here it goes. Mark, thanks for asking. All I can say is that even with all of my experience in research of predicted data, no one knows precisely for sure. Now, stop right there. This gains credibility because no one on this meeting knows exactly for sure. And before when they asked how's the market, they, they weren't going to hold you to anything. So after you say point number two, point number three is this. That said, the more that I know about your situation and what you may look be looking to do, the more I can refine my answer and help advise you. So now you're going to have them open up in terms of what we were thinking of this. We were thinking of that. And then you end by saying, and now I'd like to ask you a question because they've given you to ask them a question because they begin by asking you a question. Now I'd like to now I'd like to ask you a question. When do you think you might be making your next real estate move? OK, that's going to have a person that's going to show you transparent, you're, you're honest, you're, you're, you, you, you're, you're prepared in terms of that. Now let's move over to buyers and sellers. You're going to have buyers now that are going to begin to say this possibly in some of your markets. Your markets are all different, OK? And so this doesn't apply to everybody. But one thing you can tell you can say about real estate is this. Real estate never performs as a commodity or as a stock. The stock market can drop 30% on Friday, and it can come back 30% on Tuesday. Real estate never, ever performs that way. It trends. It goes into a direction. And you've got to say, well, gee, with the rising unemployment rate and the the way that the economy has been traumatized by the budgets and the debt, okay, what is going to happen? Are we going to see prices go up? They may go up right now. I'm in Connecticut. People are going nutty to get out of the city. Those are blips. But in terms of the long term, I may not be right, but I'm, we're going to see this happen more often. You're going to have agents say to a buyer, hey, this property used to be 500 and it's dropped to 450. It's a great buy. But the buyer is not going to buy because the buyer is going to say this. But we think it's going to drop further. Because, because what happens is that when people think that prices are going to drop, Stacy sets in, things stop. So you have to have answers. So what I'm saying is that any time for the next year, if you have any dip in prices, if you do, I don't know. I hope you don't. If you have any dip in prices or people think that prices are going to drop, which, which is two different things, and they say, we're going to wait because we think prices are going to drop further. Here's what you say. Well, Mark, the property was on, used to be 450 Now it's four. Worst case scenario, where do you think this home could drop to in the next year? Alan, I think it could drop to 400 Then, Mark, why don't we see if we can buy it today for next year's price? Because now you're stopping the bleeding. Because you can say to a buyer, you may be able to buy this property today for less money than somebody might buy it a year from now, even if prices drop 10%. Now, let's talk about sellers. Gee, we're thinking of holding off. Okay, we're thinking of holding off, right? Now, the fact that you're thinking of holding off may be the very reason why you shouldn't hold off, because there's what's happening right now is a sitting-on-the-fence syndrome with home sellers. They're all going to wait and see. And that's going to create a glut of inventory. And then that's going to disrupt the supply and demand ratio in favor of the buyers. But let me just say this. Here's what you say to every buyer and seller. The people that are the most active and people are active all over the country. In some markets, there's more activity than in years right now. The people who are the most active, okay, are the people who are buying or selling not as much for economic reasons but for lifestyle reasons. So, Mark, let me ask you this. Is there somewhere right now or some lifestyle right now that you'd rather have than, you're presently, than how you're presently living? Because that's what you do, Because if that's the case, you should definitely sell now while interest rates are low, while people still have jobs, while we're going through a refinancing and mortgage bonanza, okay? You should be all over this if you're... If you're Predicate is lifestyle. If you're trying to time the market, who knows? Okay, could be three years, could be five years. Okay, you have to have reasons. And I'm not saying that 
this is like uh, the only reasons, but all I'm saying is this, you need to be very, very prepared. Now, the other things I want to reimagine has to do with how we can have greater value immediately, okay, uh, and greater confidence. Now, one of, one of the things that we have to do is that we have to have confidence that any single time a home seller gives us an opportunity to list their property, we will never fail. We have to be that confident because if you're not that confident, you will not invest in your career and you will not be, you will not be in tune. Gino Blafari always talks about the reticular activating uh, network. I, I like to say it this way. You could have a, a mother or father asleep at two o'clock in the morning and their infant could um, cough and they hear it. But if two automobiles collide out in front of the home, they don't hear it because they've told their brain that they need to hear their baby if their baby coughs. They don't need to know about if there's, a, if there's an accident, okay, on Tropicana Road. Okay, now the next, so, so what does that mean? Mark, we have a lot of people in this business still today that actually say this. Hi, John, what do you do for a living? And John will say this. Well, Mark, I'm in real estate, but I used to be a teacher. Oh, I'm in real estate, uh, but I used to work at the casino. Oh, I'm in real estate, but I used to work at the spa. I'm in real estate, but I used to work at Anaheim, Anaheim Stadium. They actually say this. It's like saying to somebody, I'd like you to meet my wife, Alice, and here's my ex-wife, Betty. Okay? <laughs> because basically what they're doing is they're apologizing for what they do, but even more significantly, they're repelling business. And one of the reasons that because they're in real estate, but real estate's not in them. We have never had a time in history where people are going to be as interested in real estate as right now. Right this minute, everybody's going to be more deeply involved in real estate and concerned. Okay. I just received the other day uh, Zoom invitations for our whole neighborhood by a local realtor to give an update because of what COVID-19 may do to our values. Okay. I'm telling you, that Zoom meeting will be flooded with, with people. Okay. Now. The next point is this. How do you get very confident? As I've always said, Mark, our industry does not have a image problem. We have a value problem. Okay. When it comes to image, we could not be in better shape. We're prodigiously photoshopped. That's why sometimes homeowners will say, geez, I thought your, your daughter was coming. Or, gee, I thought your son was going to be here. Nice to meet you, though, senior. Okay. So we're prodigiously photoshopped. OK, that's number one. You don't have to worry about it because you got that Pat Riley haircut going for you, Mark. OK, <laughs> but we're we're prodigiously Photoshop. That's number one. Number two, we're resplendently. Number two, we're resplendently dressed. You of all people and Gino, you're like cousins. OK, that's number two. Number three, we invented personal promotion. Number four, we've been writing our own reviews for 50 years. And the last point is this. And parking garages are brimming with our BMWs. Our industry does not have an image problem. We have a value problem because a lot of people perceive a real estate transaction as a fee inflated event, which they have to subsidize in order to promulgate an inefficiently run industry. Simply put, they think they're being overcharged. And so now why do they think that? because we've been communicating lesser value. Let's take a look at this, okay? There's some things that we've got to reimagine. I have a list. Number one, we've got to give up the word listing presentation. Mark, in all of your successful years, and that will be every year in real estate, have you ever had a homeowner call you or any of your offices in your three-state empire and say, oh, by the way, um, could somebody please come over and make a listing presentation? We'd love to have a listing presentation because we know you realtors go to conventions and you go up and down the exhibit aisles with your little trick-or-treating bags, okay, and you buy listing presentations. Can you come over and make a 21-point listing presentation? No, because we're behind the times. Homeowners hate listing presentations. They prefer marketing presentations. They prefer marketing proposals. And this isn't just semantics. 
That's why we have created the home marketing system. That's why Chris Stewart and I created the virtual home marketing system. What's the difference between a listing presentation and a marketing proposal? A listing presentation is about you, your company, and what you're going to do. A marketing proposal is about them. Mark, you're a great example. Your whole world of brokerage is about your agents and your brokers. It's never been just about you. It's never been just about the brand. It's all about them. That's a great mentorship for everybody in terms of consumers. The only way we have access to people is through their concerns. And every homeowner on earth wants a marketing proposal. They don't want to go through this little dog and pony show okay, that the industry has subjected them to and turn them all into listing presentation victims for decades. Now, if you, if you have a marketing proposal, you might end up doing something like this. I created the whole marketing system, as you know, Mark, for many brands. Here's, here's an agent in Connecticut who I turned to before I was with HSF. Her name is Julie Vanderblue. She's the number one marketing person I've met ever in the industry in terms of marketing a property. And I say this as the former CEO of Realtor.com. I say this with Mike Ferry dedicating his book to me. I've been around the, the, the block, okay? Every single property is a 23-page lifestyle story. So when she meets with a home seller, she brings these lifestyle stories, and they say, tonight we're here to create a co-narrative. We're here to create um, what you're going to miss, okay? The, the home improvements. Every single thing goes into... Neighbors Know Best, program I brought to Berkshire Hathaway, testimonies from the neighbors. Whether it's a $100,000 property or a $20 million property, this isn't a listing presentation. This is part of a marketing proposal. This is exactly what we're going to do for you. So this isn't just semantics, listing versus marketing. Now, because we, now because we love the word listing, okay, we refer to 100% of the agents in the country who represent home sellers, Mark, we actually still refer to them as listing agents. A listing agent sounds like your job is over. Every person in your company does a lot more than just list a home mark. They'll do a lot more than that. But when they refer to themselves and their colleagues as listing agents, it sounds like their job is over. The buyer at least has a buyer agent, which suggests representational value, that somebody has somebody representing them. We don't represent people. We represent the listing. See, we're listing agents. And one of the reasons why about 25% of realtors self-identify as being a realtor, okay, is because the most important thing we do is represent home sellers, and we don't even say, who's the marketing realtor? Who's the marketing agent? You don't hear people say, hi, I'm a darker tour. Oh, hi, um, my wife's an architect. Oh, my son's an engineer. But one of the reasons we don't respect it in terms of our value, it all stems from listing agent, listing presentation, and therefore you can't be confident that it's impossible for somebody to say no to you if they're selling the home because the entire industry has a completely flawed approach to communicating value. A listing presentation is performative. A marketing proposal is collaborative like you are, Mark. A listing presentation is performative. I want to help you get the best price in the shortest period of time with the least inconvenience. Oh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself, about my company, and what we'll do to sell your home. All, well, how are you going to go electing an agent? No one in the history of the world in any other business would ever say, how are you going to go about selecting a doctor? Jesus, you're already here. We, 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 I'm confused. How are you going to go about selecting a lawyer? Jesus, I didn't think we had choices. No one else would ever be that dumb to ever say to a home seller, but it's even more perverse because what the agent is really saying, Mark, is this. Hey, look at folks, before we can talk about what's your concern, we first have to resolve the uncertainty of whether I'm gonna get this listing or not. Let's go over this, this is all about me. So these are things we need to reimagine. Something else we've gotta reimagine is this. Every single coach in the history of the industry has all trained agents the same way and they're all 100% wrong in terms of this. Homes don't sell because of price. And I love Mike Ferry. He's helped more people make fortunes. I adore him. I'm one-tenth of 1% 1 of successful as Mike. Uh, but I'll say this. But in terms of that, that's the wrong advice. 
Because if the only reason a home doesn't sell is because of price, then the only reason a home does sell is because of price. And that leaves our profession as overpaid appraisers gouging homeowners. There's only one reason why a home doesn't sell, and that's because of ineffective marketing, because price is part of marketing, but marketing is not part of price. And if somebody goes through their entire career thinking that homes don't sell because of price, you're stepping on your own ear hose and you're reducing your significance. Because again, to be deliberately redundant, if the only reason a home does not sell is because of price, then the only reason a home does sell is because of price, why am I paying you? Okay, it just doesn't make any sense in terms of that. There's only one reason a home doesn't sell, that's because of ineffective marketing, because price is part of marketing. Now, if you've told your brain, homes don't sell because of price, do you think you're gonna do more or less marketing for the home? You're gonna do less. When you do a brochure, you're just doing it to placate the home seller. You're winking as if it's important because we really don't understand our greater value in terms of that. So we've got to change that. Another thing we've got to change is how we present pricing. If you're going to get, see, I want people calling homeowners right now saying, geez, I'm calling I'm, I'm calling everyone in the community to give an update on real estate. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. Um, um, when do you think you might be making your next real estate? Are you looking to sell? Are you looking to buy or whatever? You, you have permission now to, to give updates to everybody. I've been asked to give updates to all of my clients in the community. How are you doing, folks? Hope you're staying safe. And then you get into a conversation. But if you think when you but if you if, if they have an interest and if you think that it's in, if it's impossible not to get the listing, you make more phone calls. How many more people would you call? How many more people would you do ad works? How many more people would you send postcards to? How many more people would you try to have Zoom meetings if you thought it was impossible not to get the listing if they became serious? You do all of those to a much greater degree. You can't be that confident, in my opinion, unless you're a psycho, okay, if you have the wrong approach to pricing. Here's the wrong approach to pricing, Mark. This is the way the entire industry has been trained to handle pricing. And I'm going to take it down a little bit so I'm not, you don't think I'm a, you don't know the maniac that I am. Okay. <laughs> so now I'm going to take it down. Um, it's, it goes like this. Oh, oh folks, he, he, here's the way the industry has been trained to handle pricing. Oh, folks, I went into my computer. This column on the here, okay, this would be um, your comp. These are other homes in the market, Mark. That would be your competition. Now, I'm saying this disgustingly. I'm saying this mockingly. But this is how the industry has been trained. This column here, Mark, these are other homes on the market right now. This would be your competition. Or oh, this column over here, this is um, absorption rates. Or oh, this column here, this is days on the market. Or oh, this column here, these are homes that were withdrawn, Mark, okay? Okay, as if you're really bothered by it. This, this column here is, uh, is some economic. That's the way the entire industry has been trained. Why is that? Because software companies have come in and taken over the, the thinking for the industry. Because there's nice software packages from the MLS now that spit all this stuff out and they've subsumed our intelligence. They have co-opted our critical thinking. Now, the reason, the, the reason this is the worst way to ever introduce pricing is as follows. Because no strategic thinking went into this, this ridiculous presentation. What strategic thinking was missing? Number one. What percentage of realtors, when it comes to their own personal residence, overprice their own property? Try 100%. What percentage of realtors have access to all of the data? Try 100%. What percentage of homeowners have a price in mind before you arrive? 100%. What percentage of homeowners like the data? Try zero. What does that make you? The bearer of bad news. What happens to the bearer of bad news? It's called shoot the messenger. Okay? We have to become much more evolved. How do we introduce pricing? Mark, I put together Berkshire Hathaway Home Services has made a science of pricing properties here in Las Vegas, okay, here in Phoenix. And by the way, city states, the Phoenician Empire was city states. Okay, um, we've made a science of pricing properties here in Las Vegas, Mark. Some of our clients want to price their property based on the data, okay? and a CMA and appraiser, we can come back to that because they want to make sure that the home appraiser is out. They want to make sure they don't offend the pricing sensibilities of the buyer or the buyer agents. Then some of our clients take pricing strategy number two. They want to price their property 
in what we call the less is more pricing strategy. They'll even put it a little lower than the data because they're anticipating competition or they're hoping to even have some bidding, a bidding competition. Strategy number two. Uh, Mark, strategy number three, some of our clients, they price their property on what we call the retail pricing strategy. They want to put it a little higher because they think buyers are going to want to negotiate. Now, these three strategies, um, which strategy philosophically seems to be the most appealing to you folks? Now, at that time, they're just going to say, well, what are we talking about? What's the data? But what you have done is you have tenderized, you have tenderized the homeowner and you've shown them that I'm looking at pricing as a strategy from your prism as opposed to I'm just a little robot that went to my training class on how to do a CMA, okay, and my spreadsheet, okay? And then, and so at the end of the presentation, you're going to have people go like this. Geez, oh, can we get back to you? Let us think about it. Then They don't want more time to think about your brochures. They don't want more time to review your testimonials. They've been traumatized over the way the pricing subject was handled. And it even gets worse, Mark, because 100% of the agents in, the, in our industry have actually been encouraged to use the word comps at some time in their career. Saying to a homeowner, let's take a look at the comps is akin to saying, let's take a look at some comparable children. I brought some pictures, okay? I've got, because your kids are, you've got one blonde head, you got red and one brunette. I brought three pictures, one's a blonde, One's a brunette, one's a redhead. Let's review it together. There's no difference. There's no difference in the world. Because anytime any realtor has ever said to a home seller, let's take a look at some similar homes or some comps, every homeowner in the history of California, Arizona, and Nevada has said the same thing. But they don't have five bedrooms. But they don't have a view. They don't have a concierge. They don't have a swimming pool. They don't have an outdoor kitchen. When are we going to grow up? When are we going to learn we're killing people? Now, what should we say instead if we're going to be more confident to do more business right now? Here's what you say. Mark, let's take a look at properties which buyers will be looking at at the same time they're looking at your property. Okay? We don't have to keep insulting people. We don't have to get into a comparison. Homes compete. They don't compare. Now, the other point I'll say is this. I'm going to say something that would be a good thing here at the halfway mark, and that is this, Mark. I've always said this. Every realtor in the country has to either become much nicer or much nastier. There's no in-between. Either become much nicer and more effusive in how we praise people and get beyond only having six words to describe every home we represent. You, you've heard them. Your home is lovely, beautiful, charming, gracious, spacious, and elegant. That's our whole vocabulary. And then every property is either park-like setting, you've heard that one, or professionally landscaped. So, if, if, so we've got to step up our game in terms of manifesting more descriptive ability, or we've got to go in the opposite direction and insult the living daylights out of people. We've got to walk into people's homes and say, what died? And I'm not kidding. You've got to either shake people up or you've got to make them feel better because the people that are in the middle aren't successful. And Mark, I'm going to give the, the, the most successful technique ever in terms of a commission or fee challenge. But I'm going to have to ask you permission. Now, the number one approach I've ever heard because some of your agents are having people being challenged on their fee, okay, over the years. And that could continue, although I think it's going to come down. Uh, I think it's going to be better in that regard. And as we all know, fees are negotiable. But the most successful technique I've ever heard, and I, I heard it firsthand with my number one agent, is full of profanity. It's full of obscenities. Now, I'm not going to say the obscenities because today's not I'm going to end my career. But what I'd like to say, Mark, is this. May I have your permission to give this technique if I bleep out the swears? <laughs> okay, this is this is the technique. This is the technique, and I share this at I share this at summit. Okay, and I'm going to say it very slow so everyone gets it. You ready? My top agent, her name was Michelle, and she's giving me permission to use her name. My top agent, Michelle, and she had a license plate, Sotheby's one, very elegant woman, Ivy League graduate. She said, Alan, 
can I use your office? I have a builder that wants me to throw in $10,000 at the closing. I said, sure, go ahead. So, but I overheard her through my office. This is her technique, Mark. There's no bleeping, bleeping way that I'm going to cut my bleeping, bleeping commission. What do you think I am? A bleeping, bleeping hooker? Standing outside the Lincoln Tunnel at three o'clock morning, giving bleeping, bleeping to sealers? If you think I'm going to cut my bleeping, bleeping commission, you can take your home and shove it up your bleeping, 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 and I know that it will fit. <laughs> now, with that, in my whole professional career, I never said a swear word in, at my company, and I don't around my family. I was drafted by the Boston Celtics, so I grew up in the streets playing basketball, so I'd use profanity with my friends. But I was traumatized, literally. So I ran into my office, Mark, and I said, Michelle, just so you know, e is not going to cover this. <laughs> e is not going to cover this, Michelle. And I'll never forget what she said. Yeah, but do you think he's bringing it up again? And he didn't. But here's the point. Either be nasty like that or get much more advanced in terms of making people feel good. That was her stick. We used to go on marketing presentations, and if somebody said, oh, we're thinking of also bringing in John from Remax, she'd say this. Oh, I know John. I have a lot of respect for John. John's done a great job turning his life around. I have a lot of respect for him, okay? But that's, that's the way Michelle conducted her business. But none of your agents would ever perform that way because if you were their leader, because their excellent breeding is an impediment to that type of behavior. So now I want to get to counter general ways of getting business right now. And I'm going to begin, I'm going to begin with having closing techniques for buyers, okay? Now, ask, I'd like everybody to answer this question, it's rhetorical. When you show a property and a buyer seems as though they want to buy it or they like it, but they haven't said they want to buy it, what do you say? Now, keep in mind, 100% of your income is based on how you communicate. Now, I've asked that question for 30 years, Mark, in all 50 states and in Europe. What do you do when somebody says, uh, they, they don't say, they seem like they like it. Oh, I liked it. Oh, nice, nice. Oh, I love the view. What do you say? I've had some agents say this. Maybe 20% will say this. Oh, that depends on the situation. No, that is the situation. Number one. Number two. Well, what, what do you like? Never ask anybody what they like. It would be like somebody saying, what do you like about your husband? <laughs> what do you like about your wife? That's actually negative. Get rid of that. Reimagine that. Okay. Also, never say anything so stupid as that, could you see yourself living here? No, I can see myself living anywhere. I could be in a cell. Give me a lot of books and some pizzas, okay, and some White Castle hamburgers. Put me in a cell. I can see myself living there, but that doesn't mean I want to live there. Okay, so ne don't ever ask that. Never say, never say to them, um, um, would you furnish it? That's ridiculous. So what should you say? What you should say is this. Based upon what you've seen, in your opinion, do you feel this home meets your needs or meets your needs? Very simple. You're not saying, don't you, isn't it great? You're not leading the witness. You're not manipulating people. Now you show that property, you show that property in, uh, in, in Camelback in Arizona, and somebody says, um, no, it's not for us. Then what? I've asked that question to thousands of realtors. Well, great, let's go see something else. You're not being paid as a salesperson to have that response. Um, or some people will say this, what didn't you like? They didn't say there wasn't anything they didn't like. Why are, you, why are you bringing negativity? Why are you destroying the karma? So what should you say? People don't have the answers, Mark. Here's what you say. Apparently, you have some reason for feeling that way. May I ask what it is? In your opinion, do you feel this home meets your family's needs? No, it's not for us. As opposed to what didn't you like? What do you like? Well, you said you wanted this. You said you wanted the school. Okay, what's? am I stupid? Are you stupid? You forget that and you just go... Apparently, you have some reason for feeling that way. 
may ask where it lives, which is better than just saying why, because they're not at the police station. So apparently you have some reason for feeling that way. May I ask what it is? Yes, the bedrooms are too small. The taxes are too high. The ceilings aren't high enough. There's no pool. We don't like the neighborhood. No matter what you hear for the rest of your year, you have the right answer. Now, what would your answer? Well, gee, there's a home on so-and-so. It's got great ceilings. Oh, I know a place that's got a pool. See, now what happens, you take that buyer, you show them a place they like the pool, they like the ceilings, but they don't like the neighborhood. Then you're off to another neighborhood. They like all of that. Taxes are too high. Two weeks later, they finally say this to you. You know what? We think we'll wait till the fall in. And you've wasted two weeks of your life because you didn't have surgical selling professional techniques just as doctors do, lawyers do, and everybody, all the professionals do. So now what should you say? The ceilings are too low. Well, if you weren't concerned about the size of the, the height of the ceilings, or we don't like the neighborhood. If you weren't concerned about the neighborhood, let's say the neighborhood was more to your liking, then in your opinion, do you feel this home might meet your family's needs? Oh, yeah, but we still wouldn't want it. Well, apparently you have some other. Well, Alan, we're going to wait till the fall. Away. I need to know that. There's too many opportunities to make money because some of you are in markets that people like to shop and look at homes because they're, they're on vacations. This is especially problematic for your Nevada and your Arizona markets. When I was in brokerage in New Jersey, we never met one person that just wanted to take a tour to see the countryside. If they were there, okay, if they were there, they were there to buy. You've got people out there on vacations thinking about their retirement seven years down the line, and some of you are spending three weeks with them. You have to have surgical language. So in your opinion, do you feel this from the very first home? And don't say, well, I would have found that out at the office because they reveal everything at the office. Well, based on what you've seen, in your opinion, do you feel this home meets your family needs? Uh, yeah, but it's not for us. If you have some reason for feeling that way, may I ask what it is? Yeah, the, um, there's no swimming pool. Well, if you weren't concerned about a pool, let's say that it had a pool, would you be interested? Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, the fact that it doesn't have a pool, that may be the very reason you should consider it because you'll be able to put in the pool that you want, okay? But boom, you can take it from there. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to make a sale. But you never again, this is time management for buyers. You never again going to get people right now say, we'd like to sell a home, but we're concerned about the economy. Well, if you were concerned about the economy, let's say that wasn't an issue, then would you want to put your home on the market? Well, you know, we still don't know because we don't know. See, you've got to be able to have professional selling techniques. Now let's move on to expired listings, okay? Now, not everybody wants expired listings, but you shouldn't take that off the plate. Here's the way the industry has taught people to handle expires. We've got to reimagine this. Um, hello, uh, Mr. Jones. Hi. Are you aware that your home is no longer on the market? Oh, do you also know your sun flung chemistry? <laughs> do you also know that you're a loser? Okay. Do you know also know that everyone in this town is making fun of you? I mean, for whatever gave us the right to be the bearer of bad news. So you've got to, if you're going to be successful, You've got to now become either prodigious of calling people or knocking on doors. And I've created a program for Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Neighbors Know Best. That's the ultimate door knocking program. But let's stop right now with the telephone. The telephone is a game. Make it a joke. It's ridiculous. A lot of people sound on the phone as if they're tough. They're, they're big tigers. But when you meet them in person, they're little pussycats. They're scared little people that sound ferocious on the phone. That's how you should... Picture them. Just like when I have people call me, they'll go like this, Mark. Oh, hi, Mr. Dalton. This is not a sales call. It's a courtesy call. Oh, it's a courtesy call? Oh, I'm very sorry. All I take is sales calls. <laughs> I don't have time for courtesy calls. If you've got something to sell, I'd love to hear it. But, geez, it's too bad this was only a courtesy call. Okay, why don't you do this? Why don't you give me your home number and I'll call you later tonight, okay? <laughs> or they'll go like this. Hi, and I don't have a son. Hi, is this Mr. Dalton? Yes, it is, but do you want the father or the son? They, they say the son or the mother, whatever. But all I'm saying is this. The phone is a game. Relax, it's a joke, but it can make you a fortune in your lifetime. But you have to be scripted. You have to know what you're going to say. So let me give you what you should say, and you will get every single expired listing ever call. Here's how you call. Somebody answers. Hi, uh, Alan Dalton from Berkshire Hathaway Home Service. Now, by the way, if I'm calling a home between 500000 and a million, I'm saying, hi, Alan Dalton calling from the Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Luxury Lifestyle Division. Okay? 
Um, now, I didn't say I'm certified. I didn't say I have a designation, okay? But hi, I'm calling. Hi, this is Alan Dalton. I'm a luxury lifestyle specialist over here at the Paradise um, office at the Paradise Regional Sales and Marketing Center. How are you doing tonight? Now, I'm not, I'm not calling Lee, so I'm not going to get any guff because they, they sense my confidence. Hi, hi, Bob. Alan Dalton calling from the Berkshire Hathaway Home Services uh, Paradise Regional Sales and Marketing Center. I'm a luxury lifestyle specialist. I specialize in especially representing luxury homes that haven't that I believe should sell. Has anybody told you exactly why your home didn't sell? Well, no, no, not really. Well, there's only one reason a home doesn't sell in Las Vegas, and that's because of ineffective marketing. Oh, I thought it was pricing. No, price is just part of marketing. Do you still have an open mind about different marketing ideas? Great. Well, I'd, love, I'd like to come over and show you how we can upgrade your marketing. See, when you talk that way, okay, you're going to get every single appointment. Oh, by the way, I want to thank you for just even staying on the phone. Um, well, Alan, how come you didn't sell the home? Don't lie because it wasn't sold to me. Don't lie because I don't only sell my own listings. Say, because I didn't have the right buyer. But if I had the right buyer, that would have been a statistical aberration because there's 12,000 agents, and it would be unusual for any one agent out of 12,000 have a buyer. But what I'm concerned about is why didn't one of the other 11,000 agents have the right buyer? And that's because of ineffective marketing. Um, do you still have an open mind about different marketing ideas? I called people for 20 years. I did. I called for my whole company. Every Monday, I called for 32 offices. I made listing presentations for 32 offices. People can't say no to that. Okay, do you still have an open about different marketing ideas? Then if it goes further, was there some reason why they – was there some reason why they advertise your suburban home here in California as a as a contemporary? Well, 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 because it is. Well, no, your home is transcendental. Your home is a home for all seasons and all. Why would you limit the appeal? There's some people that come to our office and say a ranch home. So others say they want a colonial. Okay, some say they want a Mediterranean. I can't believe they put in that your home was a temporary. Well, well, it is. I know that, but that's what I'm talking about. Do you still have an open mind about different marketing ideas? I can't believe when they did the photographs, they had the cars in the driveway. We need to get together. Open the gate. Say, honey, I know what it is. It was the cars in the driveway. This guy, he's right. We've got to meet with him. So, in other words, you can make so much money if you call every single expired and work a big region in terms of that. Now let's talk about for sale by owners. For sale by owners. Here's the way the industry's been trained to call for sale by owners. We're talking about instant money right now. Here's the way they've been taught to call for sale by owners. Um, have you had many offers? That's like going to a restaurant where no one's eating and saying, are you always this busy here? People aren't stupid. It's a put down. And when we say to a for sale by owner, have you had many offers? They hate us because they think privately we hope that they haven't had offers. It doesn't get any more perverse than this. It's like going to a doctor and the doctor saying, Mark, how have you been feeling? And you think the doctor's praying that you've been sick. Okay. And then when we ask somebody, have you had many years? It forces them to lie. And because they lie, they can't do business with us. So coaches had to say it's a drip, drip effect. Okay. Because it takes the FISBO weeks to get over the trauma. Here's what you say to facility by owners. Mark, if all you want to do is sell your home, you don't need me because you can sell your own home. They don't expect to hear that, and it's the truth, and it's disarming and detonating. If all you want to do is sell your home, Mark, you don't need me because you and I know you can sell your own home. But now if you want to market your home, Mark, I'd love to represent you. Now when you sell a home, Mark, you sell it to a buyer. When we market a home, we get it sold to the right buyer. See, I don't want to just create, I don't want to just sell your home, I want to create competition for your home. I want to leverage the laws of supply and demand. I believe that 12,000 realtors do a 6% better job than you on your own, okay? Because we have a buyer pool, and we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars to create buyers to come through our networks. And that's just how it is, okay? Um, and so, in fact, if all you want to do is sell, you have a statistical better chance of selling your home than I do, okay? You as an because in our marketplace, less than 5% of the time, the so-called listing agent also brings the buyer. So now what I'd like to do is show you how we, we're going to market your home. Then you've got to be ready for fee challenges. What do you do if somebody says, well, the other company said they'd do it at 5%. Now, we all know fees are negotiable. But what if somebody says, well, the other company said they'd do it at 4%. What, what do you say? Here's what I used to say. Well, knowing, with all due respect, Mark, knowing their marketing, I'm a little surprised they're trying to charge you that much. 
because they're basically a listing company and we're a marketing company. Or, Alan, what's your fee? Our fee is 6% market. I'm going to make you a promise. I'm going to promise you that after I get you the great results, I know you're going to want to offer me a bonus, but I'm going to turn it down. But let's, well, we can always come back to the fee later if you don't see the value of the marketing. What's your fee? Our marketing fee is 3%, and together we're going to decide what we're going to offer the co-broke. Well, the other one said they do it at 5%. You know what? Rather than having your home on the market for a million dollars at 5%, I'd rather have us put on the market for one million and ten thousand dollars at 6% so you have a, a customized home marketing system. You, you know, Mark, one of the reasons why your home is so valuable is because when it was built, you didn't cut corners. And money follows value. And just like you didn't cut corners building the home, let's not cut corners on the marketing of the home. The other thing is this. Um, don't, try to vet, don't try to justify fees based on service. It must be skills. Alan, what's your fee? It's, it's uh, 6%. Well, Mark, the other company said they'd do it at 4%. Well, because but we get better service. You get better service? Well, my son has a $100,000 home. Will you give him great service? Oh, yeah. Will you give him the same? Oh, yeah. Then why do I have to pay 10 times as much for the same great service? Does everything cost exactly 10 times as much? The facil signs, the pictures? What's going on here? This doesn't seem scientific to me. Alan, because my skills are worth at least one point or two point to you. My negotiating will be worth at least one point. That's 10000 to you. It's a thousand to your son. But if you're going there and if you're bringing them, you're de developing with them a lifestyle story that's breathtaking, they're not going to have the nerve to ever again in your career bring up commission because they're going to be mesmerized by the value. Okay. So now let's move on from the, let's move on to that, to the, the marketing proposal itself. Okay. First of all, if you're going to get more appointments, here's some things you've got to do. You've got to understand the difference between social media social networking, and social media marketing. What's the difference? Well, if you're putting pictures on Facebook at the barbecue, that's social networking. If you're giving people a link to a blog, that's social media. But social media marketing is based on the combination of social and marketing. So everybody on this Zoom meeting should have their personal definition of what marketing is. And I've asked this for years in 50 states. What's marketing? Well, it's advertising. No, that's advertising. Well, it's personal promotion. No, that's personal promotion. Okay? Um, it's public relations. No, that's public relations. Marketing is this. You first determine the unmet needs of the marketplace, and then you create goods and services to effectively respond to those needs. So, for example, if somebody's on a park bench with an ad, spouses selling houses, God bless you, you're making more money than the people who do nothing. But that's not marketing. That's personal promotion. If somebody's on a supermarket carriage, okay, that's not marketing because the consumers aren't missing that. In fact, I had somebody come up to me several months ago, Mark, and he says, Mr. Dalton, I'm no longer on the supermarket carriages. And I said, why is that? He says, because I went home to dinner and my 12-year-old daughter was weeping. And I said, honey, what is it? And she says, daddy, all my friends at school think you're missing, okay? And so advertising on supermarket carriages is not marketing. Sending pumpkins is not marketing. Sending calendars is not marketing. People never say, honey, we just got this pumpkin. I guess we should move up. I guess we should be downsizing. But people who do these little trinkets and activities that are very light, okay, they'll make a lot more money than those who don't. But now let's talk about how we can make money right now and moreover with three other big ideas. The first one is this. I brought to Berkshire Hathaway Home Services the real estate and lifestyle planning guide. What's the thinking behind it? Many years ago, I asked myself this question. What percentage of the people, and I'm going to make this re regional now, what percentage of the people in Las Vegas or Nevada at some time in their life regret not owning enough real estate? What percentage from Troy Ryerson to, 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 to you, Mark. What percentage of the people in Phoenix, in Arizona, at some time regret not owning a real estate? What percentage of the people in California? Many, almost everybody. Next question. What percentage of consumers have developed a real estate plan for life? Basically zero. That's the unmet need of the marketplace. Why is it that people have one doctor, one lawyer, 
one financial planner and they've got eight realtors. That's why the old joke, we've got a friend in real estate. Well, if you don't have a friend in real estate, you probably don't have a friend. That's the old joke. And the point is this, if we're going to survive the next wave of disruption, where people now are going to see 74% of homeowners right now select a realtor based on somebody they already know and trust. Why is that? Because before now, hundreds of millions of dollars were never invested to disrupt that. When I was the CEO of Realtor.com for six and a half years, 99% of the traffic to our site clicked on find a home and only 1% clicked on find a realtor and they were realtors. So buyers search for property, sell search for agents, but there's never been a mechanism for them to search before. The, 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 the consumers have never been educated that when you are looking for somebody to sell your home, you go to the internet. No, you go to the internet to buy a home. Now, millions of dollars right now are being spent on ads across the country to get people to go to a certain category of agents, and there's more windows that have banners now, we'll list your home for 1% or a half a percent or $500. And so this is the next wave of disruption. The only way that we can preemptively inoculate ourselves against the inevitable um, listing side disruption is we've got to convert consumers into clients. Every single coach is still only talking about databases. That's passe. We've got to start talking about client bases. I could have the largest database tomorrow in Arizona. I could buy the voter registration rolls for the Republican and Democratic Party, but that wouldn't guarantee I'd be successful because I have a database. I could have the largest sphere of influence that doesn't guarantee me anything unless I influence my sphere. It's not a sphere of influence. It's how do you influence your sphere? And right now we have to, and this is Chris's genius and Chris's vision, we have to evolve from transactional to relational. But if we become more relational, we'd be more transactional. Every single person in your company, in my opinion, Mark, should get the real estate lifestyle planning guide. There's a letter with that in the learning center. They should put, they should write down every single person that already knows and likes them. They should send them that guide saying, uh, this might help you as you plan for the future. Let me know if I can help you. Nothing more. Because that's a different spirit of intent. Because here's what we do instead. You'll actually see ad, agents with ads like this. Um, I'd like to be your realtor for life. But that doesn't reconcile with when you're ready to buy or sell a home, give me a call. The public thinks that we're decidedly only transactional, that we're an industry of drive-by shooters. We're not relational. We're not, but imagine a financial planner not having a financial plan. Once you, once, you, once you let everybody you know in your sphere of influence that you want to encourage them to plan in the same way we want our teachers to encourage our children and grandchildren to read, once you cross that bridge of letting people know that you operate on a long-term basis as a forever agent, they're not going to replicate that with competitive agents. They're not going to go through the same level of intimacy. In the movie, The Gangs of New York, people came over from Ireland and they were given a bowl of soup to, be, to become a Democrat. And people now today still vote Democrat because people are given a bowl of soup and it's that simple. And it's as simple as you telling people, if you want, if you want people to be your clients for life, you've got to treat them as if they're a client of life. And you can't do that just by having client appreciation parties and block parties, you've got to be able to do that. And then the other thing, so that's one thing to get business right now, just like the most successful thing I've ever seen, Mark, in the industry, to get immediate business, and I can send you this, is a postcard I designed it, how can I help you this year? I did that also for COVID-19, but it had all the things, move up, downsize, repair, remodel, refinance, okay? That if you send that out to everybody in your sphere right now, you get more business. Right now, you do more business with that. If you send that planning guide right now, by saying this is something that can help and over your life, it doesn't look like you're a circling coyote, okay, looking to capitalize on COVID. It looks like you're a virtual vulture. It looks as though you're in here for the long run, 
you're stable, you're sustainable, but you want, but you need to get business right now. But the best way to get business right now is to make it look as though you're concerned for them for, forever. Okay. And the second program is this. Neighbors know best. I'm going to end with this. Okay. Neighbors know best. Years ago in my brokerage, uh, I was the I was the um, co-owner of a 32 office company. We started from nothing. We actually built it to 60 offices, then we sold it. As Mark knows, I created all the national marketing systems for better homes and gardens all over the, the country. And and then I be, became CEO of, of um, Realtor.com. But during, during the days when I was in brokerage, one of my agents came up to me and said, Alan, I can't get this property sold on Arch Street. And because of my Boston accent, I shouldn't be saying ours, Mark, Stark, whatever. Um, but she came and she says, Alan, I can't get this property sold on Arch Street in Ramsey. It's right across from the railroad tracks. I said, here, take this yellow pad of paper, take this yellow pad of paper, go out, knock on the doors of the neighbors and ask them what they like about living in the neighborhood because they're living there. So that shows that people can be happy there because she was new to the business. She actually did it. She came back a week later with like six pages. I created, because I'm into naming things, Neighbors Know Best. When we sold our company, I gave up my ownership in the mortgage company to retain the rights of Neighbors Know Best, because that's a Google big idea. That's the best way. This agent here is going to make about two million bucks this year in a market that the average agent makes 50,000 bucks. She has a team. They knock on doors in Greenwich. In the East Coast, and you're in markets that are a lot friendlier than the East Coast, Mark. I'll say that right now. I had dinner a few months ago in New York, and you know what the waiters ask you after you've had dinner in New York? Here's what they ask you. Was anything okay? Okay, so you're in a lot friendlier marketplace than here in the East Coast. And she has her team members knocking on doors, okay, in all of these towns, getting listings, because they're there on behalf of their home seller clients, and they point out that the best way to market properties is to reviews from neighbors. So go to the learning center, get the lifestyle planning guide, get neighbors know best. And if you have to make a lot more money, not everybody does, but if you have to make a lot more money, you've got to see the people. And some of you would knock on doors for the Red Cross, but you knock on doors for real estate because you think you're extracting something for yourself. You're doing this on behalf of the properties either you represent or Mark's brokerages represent and all of his owners and, and his his whole repertoire there and his um, ret retinue, okay? You, you're working on behalf of a higher purpose because you, you're in the business of doing the best job possible of marketing uh, properties. And the last thing is this. A lot of you still have business cards that on the back of it, the card actually reads this. The sincerest compliment somebody can pay me is to send me the referrals of their family and friends. No. They're not looking to pay compliments or never mind the sincere, which means, which suggests that we live in the world of insincere and sincere compliments. It's like a tell, okay? But what you've got to do is change that to this. My greatest professional privilege is to serve the needs of your family and friends. It's completely a different message. Or you've got to be much nastier like Michelle was because here's how Michelle used to ask for referrals. I'd see in front of people at a function, she'd go like this. Um, hey, folks, can you think of anybody looking to buy or sell right now? And they'd hesitate for one second, and she'd go like this. Come on, please, think, think. <laughs> she'd yell at them, okay? <laughs> so anyway, so that's that goes full cycle. I wanted to try. Hey, look, we're in the middle of a pandemic. God bless everybody. And I try to be a little bit entertaining as well, even though whatever professionalism I have sacrifices during the process I wanted you to also have a little fun, okay, and also know that I'm aware that I am presenting here to the company of one of the most revered leaders and icons our industry has ever known, the one and only Mark Stock. And I only went four minutes over. There you go, Mark. <laughs> well, first of all, I got to show you, I got a ton, I got a ton of notes, my friend, as always. Uh, I do. I wish next time, you know, you'd bring some energy. I would appreciate that. Hey. That's very important. Um, Alan, on behalf of the entire company, there are so many great ideas that you shared. Uh, you know what? It takes a little bit of time to digest it all. You're a quick guy. <laughs> but thank Whatever. you. 
And thanks to everyone for attending. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Alan. God bless everybody. Take care.